Today's reading comes to us from the book of Psalm, chapter 20. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. Selah. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May he shout for joy over your victory and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven and mighty victories by his right hand. Some take pride in chariots, some in horses, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. They will collapse and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. Give victory to the Lord. Answer us when we call. The word of God for the people of God. This week's poem, Still Our Eyes by Maya Angelou, uh, read by Serena Williams in that video. I, um, it's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> I struggled with it, though. I've got to tell you, I struggled with this poem. Audrey is going to get into this worship service one way or another. She is just insisting on being up here. It's all right. I struggled with this poem, Uh, I struggled with this sermon a lot, I didn't have an angle, I didn't have, you know, a way into it. Sometimes a sermon during the week, it just sort of emerges and says, here, preach me, and it's fine, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes you got to wrestle with it, and I really wrestled with this, I struggled with this, Uh, well into the week. In fact, it was Thursday morning at breakfast, and I was talking with Aaron about how I was struggling to get my head around Still I Rise. And I realized in that conversation, it's because this is not my voice. This poem is not written in my voice. These are Maya Angelou's words. Serena Williams is reading them, and it's important that's the case because this this voice in this poem is the voice of someone speaking to their oppressor. It is addressed to a person. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You want to see me diminished. You want to see me bowed and broken. But still, like dust, I rise. Still, like air, like hope, I rise. It's addressed from the margins to the one who is doing the marginalizing. It's addressed by one who has been discriminated against to the person that's doing the discrimination, and I realize that from my place of privilege, I just can't speak this voice. I can't, it's not my voice here in this poem. And so I wrestled and struggled and said, how am I gonna get here? How am I gonna get, I gotta fill some time on Sunday morning. How am I gonna get into this poem and this, and, and, and I realized in the process that the struggle was good, that the, the struggle was a holy thing. The struggle was the Holy Spirit helping me to understand, and it's, struggle's not bad inherently, especially if it's the Holy Spirit that you're kind of wrestling with and struggling with. So it's not a bad thing to struggle, and, and so I struggled. And, and I realized as I was struggling that what this poem speaks of is hope, right? It's, it's a hope poem, and, um, and hope is uh, kind of, if we think about hope, it's kind of the, the assurance that the future is going to be better um, even though the present conditions don't indicate that it will, right? So it's the assurance that the future is going to be better even though there's no evidence to support that assurance, right? The present moment uh, doesn't seem like the future is going to get any better. Nevertheless, you know that it is, right? You are assured that the future is going to get better. That's where hope is. That's where hope resides. And so it was important to me in this struggle to kind of define that. And, and, I, and I realized we have to make a distinction here. We have to make a clear distinction between hope and, and something else. And I don't know that there's a term for it. But I'll just say it's optimism, right? So let's talk about what's the difference between hope and optimism. So um, optimism also thinks that the future is going to be better. But there is evidence to support that thought, right? 
So the present conditions indicate that the future is getting better. So it's, I know it is. So there's an optimistic attitude. Hope as a theological concept has nothing to support the idea that the future is going to get better. Right? Nothing to support the idea the future is going to get better. So with that in place, that's an abstract. Let me give you an example. Let me give a, like a metaphor. So it is, um, it's spring training. Baseball is back. There is great rejoicing in all the land. And every fan of every team just knows that this is the year. Playoffs, man. We're going to make the playoffs. We're going to have a, it's 100 wins, man. We've got this. Play, it's going to be a great season. It's going to be at spring training, you know, clean slate. You never know what might happen. It's a long season. It's a marathon, not a sprint. All the things that you say at spring training, right, Joe? This is going to be the year, man. Here's the difference between optimism and hope. For a Royals fan saying that, that's hope. <laughs> For a Cardinals fan saying that, that's optimism, right? Because, right? I know, I know. I, no, I know. Yep. Because on a Cardinals fan, you can sort of look at your roster and go, hey, we really got a shot. You know, this could be a good year. Royals fan, we got nothing. We got no, we got nothing. But yeah, we still feel that way, right? I still contend that the only people to ever experience true hope in this world are Kansas City Royals fans. <laughs> so many years, right? So that's the difference between hope hope and optimism. If, okay, I can use a, a, a more churchy kind of example, right? So in, in church life, we are supposed to plan for the future. We are supposed to envision the future, plan for the future, budget for the future, structure for the future. We're not supposed to just react to what's going on in the present, nor are we supposed to live in the past. We're supposed to think to the future. It's a, just common sense. Look to the future. So at Manchester, we have an amazing future ahead of us, and we are budgeting for, planning for, structuring for a lot of growth over these next five years especially. We're heading towards our 200th birthday in five years from now. We're going to start century three of our life together in mission and ministry. And the feeling is that that century is going to be even better than the other two. As good as the amazing present is and how wonderful things are, the unlimited potential of this congregation is clear. And so we plan for, we structure for, we budget for growth over these next five years. So here's the question. Is that hope or optimism? Is that hopeful or is that optimistic? Well, if it was hopeful, there wouldn't be any evidence that would lead us to do that. I don't know about y'all, but I see plenty of evidence in the present moment that would lend towards a whole lot of future growth. Every single new member class is full. We have 15, 18, 20, sometimes over 20 people in every new member class. We've got another one coming up in just a little bit too. And that's because of, of, of all y'all. All y'all been, have been inviting people to church, which is amazing. The number one reason that uh, a person comes to church for the first time, it's always been this way, and as far as I'm concerned, it probably always will be. The number one reason, you know what it is? It's not because you got a cool, user-friendly website. It's not because you have a really hip music director. <laughs> Although we do. I mean, we do. I mean, that's, that's a, you know, fringe benefit. <laughs> No, it's not, that's not the reason people come to church for the first time. They come to first church for the first time because someone they know invited them. Because someone they know invited them. And Manchester has been doing that. These past few months, we see new guests, we see invitations. So continue to do that, and, and we grow into this vision. The other thing that is evidence in this present moment that leads us to plan for future growth is the capacity of this of this congregation. So we can actually quantify this. We can put a, a dollar amount to it. And if you're not a numbers person, you can stop listening for a, a little while. I'll tell you when to come back in. So, um, so this year, our budget uh, anticipated growth is $600,000. That seems like a lot. But when we think about capacity of the congregation, there are 700 households in this congregation. Actually, there are more than that. That's the conservative estimate. That's the conservative number. It's not an estimate, conservative number. 700 households, $600,000 in new growth. That's just 850 bucks per household spread out over the year. 
that entire year. So if each household would just commit to giving $850 extra into their regular offering, we'd have this made even if we didn't welcome any new members. $850 a year, that's it. Some of you could take care of that extra giving today. You write a second check and put it in the plate. 850, new growth, go. Some of you could write the whole 600,000. That would be good too. If you could just go ahead and, <laughs> and just take care of the whole thing, that would be great. 850 might seem like a, a number. It seems like a bigger number for some people than others. It's $17 a week. $17 a week per household. You're going to spend more than that at lunch today. Way more than that at lunch today, right? If we could grow just that much with the people who are already here, we'd have this made. Not to mention the new growth that we're experiencing. Okay, if you're not a numbers person, start listening again. With us? Okay. So the point is, is this future growth, is this future planning, is this future budgeting hope or optimism? Well, there's plenty of evidence in this present situation. The present context here at Manchester indicates that growth is happening and will continue to happen. So maybe it's not quite hope. Because hope arises when there's no evidence that the future is going to get better. Hope arises when the present conditions would not indicate that the future is going to get better. Nevertheless, you believe that it is. There's hope. It's, it's, it's Romans 8. It's Romans 8. For in hope we are saved. For in hope we are saved. Now, hope that is seen, Romans 8 continues, is not hope. The Bible just says it right out like that. Hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? For we hope for what we do not see and we wait for it with patience. Hope arises when we can't see anything in this present moment that would indicate what the future holds for us. So I was wrestling with the sermon, wondering what hope was, wondering what optimism means, wondering how it applies to church life, and I realized that the direction I wanted to go for the sermon um, had flipped. It had completely flipped. And where I, whereas I was at one point going to uh, make the sermon be about proclaiming hope in the midst of hopelessness, now the Holy Spirit helped me to see that what this sermon needs to be about is listening to voices that are expressing hope in the midst of home, hopelessness. Right? So hear the distinction. The sermon's not about expressing hope in the midst of hopelessness. It's about hearing voices that are expressing hope. Uh, hearing Maya's voice, hearing Serena's voice, hearing voices from the edges, voices that the, the world tends to pu push aside for, for whatever reason, race or, or class or sexual orientation or, or gender identity or age, or whatever it might be. We're really good at pushing folks to the side to, to listen to voices that get pushed aside. It, and it, so it comes back to Psalm 20 as well. So Psalm 20 um, expresses this profound assurance that the future is going to get better. This, this knowledge that God is going to deliver a victory. I know that the Lord will look with favor upon the Lord's anointed, says this psalm. I know that God will bring us this victory. I know that we'll be able to fly our, our flags after we win this, with this battle. The thing about it is, the nation in the nation, sorry, for the nation of Israel... There should be no way that they think they're going to win any kind of thing. The, the nation of Israel in Bible times is this tiny little country with relatively no resources, almost impoverished, completely surrounded by superpowers, military and economic superpowers. And yet, when confronted by the reality of their situation, even in spite of the fact that there's no evidence in the current context that would suggest they might win anything, they have the audacity to say, God is going to deliver us this victory. I know that the Lord will deliver us this victory. That's hope, right? It reminds me of the moment in uh, um, Avengers when... <laughs> I understand this illustration will only work for a few people. I get it. It reminds me of the moment in Avengers when, like, New York City is being completely destroyed and the alien whale ships, right, yeah, are coming in and they're just 
demolishing everything, and there is no evidence that anything is going to get any better. And, and, and yet they're not, uh, they're not afraid, they're not worried, and why? Yes, because we have a Hulk. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Andy, stick together. Uh, the nation of Israel did not have the Hulk. They did not have a Hulk. They had a Yahweh. <laughs> they had a Yahweh. We're not worried because we have God. And theologically speaking at this time, it was not monotheistic yet. So their, their rationale was our God can beat up your God. I mean, literally, that's what they're, that's what they're saying. It, it, there's no reason to su suggest, to think in this present moment that they could win anything, and yet there's this expression of assurance, of hope. Not to mention the fact that this is a psalm of David, right? This is David's voice. So we're hearing David s express this assurance that the future is going to get better. David is nobody. David is the youngest son of a shepherd who lives out in the middle of nowhere. No reason to expect he would ever be king. And once he becomes king, no reason to ever expect he would be a good king. He's not even that good of a person, to be honest with you. And yet, from this voice, we hear this assurance that the future is victory. The future is goodness. The future is bright. There's no reason to think that we should. So maybe what we need to figure out how to do, personally and as a church, is hear those voices. Right? Hear those voices that are speaking this this assurance of a brighter future when there's absolutely no evidence in the present moment that it should be that way. Maybe what we should be listening for as the church are the voices of those who have been pushed aside, marginalized, oppressed. Because when present conditions are oppressive, the most important voices to listen to are those being oppressed. When present conditions are discriminatory, the most important voices to listen to are those being discriminated against. When present conditions are unjust, the most important voices to listen to are those upon whom the injustice is being perpetrated. That's who we need to figure out how to listen to, church. In other words, the people Jesus hung out with all the time. Yeah, maybe we need to listen to the voices of the people that Jesus really listened to. I told you the sermon took a flip this week. It took a major flip this week. I, you know, it was going to be about expressing hope in hopeless situations, um, and it turned out to not be that. I, I realized the poem is not in my voice. That's one of the reasons that the sermon took a flip. And the other reason that the sermon took a flip is because I had a great story that I was going to tell to illustrate hope being realized when it was completely uncertain as to whether or not it would be. Um, like how the power of hope comes to fruition, right? Most of you know, many of you know, Aaron and I are foster parents. We've been fostering for 14 years and um, have had 21-ish, 21 kids over the time. We have one now, uh, baby C., Seven months old, he's in the nursery this morning. Um, and so what was going to happen, <laughs> we had court on Thursday. And what was going to happen at court is that the judge was going to uh, concur with the plan, with the way things were going, and Carlito was going to move in with grandma and grandpa. That's what we all thought was going to happen. Um, every sign pointed to that happening. And so on Sunday morning, I was going to come up here and talk about how beautiful that moment is, how, how he now gets to live with grandma and grandpa, and how that's what we've been hoping for all along. And even though it's really hard, it's a good thing that has been realized. But that didn't happen on Thursday. That did not happen. In fact, the judge ruled um, not only that he couldn't go live with grandma and grandpa, but we actually took several steps back in the progress that we thought we had made in this case. And I will tell you that both Aaron and I feel very strongly that at best it was just miscommunication that happened uh, among the team, and at worst, outright just um, mismanagement of the case. We truly feel like an injustice has been done. 
And um, so our whole perspective has now shifted. And now of primary importance is that we, we speak for this, this little guy who not only, I mean, he literally has no voice in this process, in this story. And he just needs someone to, to speak on his behalf and to name the injustice that's been done and to work to remedy it however we possibly can. And we have several ideas in place for how we might do that. But it just illustrates, I think, how important it is for each one of us to hear the voices of those against whom injustice is perpetrated, especially because a lot of times there, there is no natural systemic place for them to actually have a voice. And, and when we're talking about structural and systemic injustice, we gotta remember there's real people that get caught up in it. There's real people uh, it's not abstract. It's not just an idea. And the question, the question, I mean, maybe the better question is not, is not how does hope get realized in the midst of hopeless situations anymore. I mean, maybe the most important question for us to think about is simply, are we listening? Are we listening? And can we hear? Can you hear the prayer of the children on bended knee in the shadow of an unknown? Empty eyes No more tears to cry Turning heavenward Toward the light Crying, who will help me to see the morning light of one more day? And if I should die before I wake, I pray. Can you feed the hearts of the children aching for home or something of their very own? Reaching hands with nothing to hold on to but hope for a better day. Blood of the innocent 
on their hands, crying, Jesus, help me to feel the sun again upon my face. For when darkness clears, I know you're near, bringing peace again. Can you hear the prayer of the children?